it's means it meant so much to me. And thank you. Uh, also, want to shout out my Street Poets family. Thank you so much. Uh, without y'all, without that connection, it probably wouldn't have happened. So just thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, this poem I wrote a long time ago. That's right. I mean, they're they're meant to last a long time and be very durable, and they have other uses. And so we often encourage cities to try things like put them up for a while, and if you don't need them anymore, you can break them down. They're panelized. You can store them, and then you can take them out if you have a wildfire or a disaster event and use them for survivors or responders. So they have a lot of versatility in that way. But when we're talking about homelessness, the intent here is not for someone to live here forever. That's not why we created this, and this is not a way that someone should live forever. We don't think that, we never have thought that. This is not a substitute for permanent housing. What are the technical and practical things that have made these cost effective and cost efficient? I mean, you just said that they can be broken down and put together quickly. Uh, you know, the materials, you know, the insulation, what is it on a very engineering standpoint? So um, our product is made from material, that is mold, mildew, and rot resistant, and it's very lightweight. So that was part of the specification. We wanted something simple to put together, simple to store, that two people could easily pick up any panel and we could put them together in an hour or less, which is kind of the average time. And so one of the really key parts to the success of Palette is that we don't use traditional construction materials. So a lot of people ask about that. Why did you choose this material type? Well, traditional construction materials are heavy, they're now very expensive. They weren't when we started Pallet, but they're very expensive now because of supply chain issues. Um, and they're, they make it really hard to put things together. Um, and we see this a lot with um, innovation in construction as well. You see modular, you see all kinds of really cool stuff coming to market. But it's hard to navigate because everything is inside the walls and it's hard to see. And so we tried to take all of our knowledge of the construction industry, the things that were cost prohibitive, that were time intensive, and we stripped all that out. So one example, um, our floors, the bases that the, the, the units sit on, they include a structural element underneath that we designed and engineered and put underneath the floor so that you don't have to pour a foundation if you don't want to. Concrete for foundations is incredibly expensive. Excavation and dirt moving is incredibly expensive. One of the most expensive parts of permanent construction. And so we took that knowledge and said, what do we need to strip out? Lumber packages are expensive. You know, um, all the structural stuff is really expensive. Can we do that another way and still meet code requirements? So we were able to build a product that meets the standard code requirements but uses alternative materials so that it meets the specifications. Is it easy to build them? I mean, do you need a special crew to come in or is it no. something that you can put in a kit that say, you know, A plus B equals yeah. a house? Yeah, so we do have some customers that put them together themselves. It just depends on, you know, if they want to try that. Um, we love job creation. If we didn't, if that wasn't obvious from before, we love creating jobs for people. We love workforce development. And so for us, the setup of our units is another opportunity to create jobs. So whenever and wherever we can, we try to do the deployments in the cities that we come to, and we try to partner with local organizations to do that so that we're creating jobs locally. So for example, these shelters and the other shelters around the city of Los Angeles have been constructed by the LA Conservation Corps primarily. So we have one or two pallet staff that come down, they supervise and train the individuals that are participating with the Conservation Corps, and those individuals are getting a chance to try out the construction industry, which we want them to get into, and they get a job opportunity and they get exposure to a really cool project in their community that's helping people that are maybe underserved. So it's a win-win for everyone and they get paid to do that work as well. Who are you hearing from? Because now cities obviously are recognizing it. You know, Governor Newsom's put an enormous amount of money into the California budget for addressing low-income housing and homelessness. Are you hearing from a lot others of other states that are looking towards what you've done in, on the West Coast and all these other communities that you've... Yeah, yeah, so we're getting a lot of interest right now, um, which we're very grateful for. Uh, cities across the country are interested in what we're doing. And in California, we've had a great deal of success um, because of great forward-thinking innovative cities like Los Angeles and the mayor's office and the city council members really stepping up and engaging and embracing innovation. I think what we were able to do here, even just with this initial Chandler site, um, and, and council member Kerkorian was a great champion for this, this was so successful. I mean, it had its issues and whatnot, but it was a very successful setup. It's been a successful uh, site and, and place for people to come. And there's been so much great coverage of it that cities across the country have seen that and said, wow, this is amazing. Maybe we could try that in our city. 
what we're seeing is a lot of cities thinking about maximum land utilization, which is part of what this was designed around as well. So you think about the city that you live in and there's sites everywhere that are just sitting there relatively unusable or they appear to be unusable. And the reality is you, pro you might not be able to or you probably can't put a permanent housing uh, product there or maybe you can, but it's gonna take two or three years to get sure. through permitting and design. So the whole concept was don't waste this opportunity to use this great piece of land to bring people inside and provide housing. This is that solution. We can set up really fast, we can take down even faster, and you can eventually turn that site into something else if you want to. And I think what cities like about it is that it's versatile and flexible. They can try it on for a while. If they don't like it, they can move the site to another location. If they want to eventually develop that location into permanent housing or a community space, they can do that and not waste their, their investment because then now they have this product that they can use in another location for the same purpose or for a different purpose. What are you hearing from other construction companies? Are people trying to come in and say, how did you do it and can we do it too? And do you mind if we steal your patent and <laughs> what can we do? And are you okay with that? Yes, I am absolutely okay with that. So our goal is to end unsheltered homelessness. I can't do that by myself, nor do I intend to. I mean, Pallet is one idea of many amazing ideas. We welcome com competition in the space. We want people to come up with more innovative ideas. We need more housing. Everybody agrees with that, both temporary and permanent. And it's gonna take a lot of amazing minds to come up with those solutions. So we produce about 50 shelters a week. We're ramping up to 100 a week. There are over half a million people in America sleeping outside. It would take me forever to shelter them all. So the more people that we can get in this space, the better. Once the villages have been put into place, there are organizations that actually sort of manage the facilities and make sure the services are provided, correct? Yeah, that's right. So Pallet actually has a requirement um, for our customers, which are often cities, counties, states, sometimes direct service providers. But we have a requirement that uh, in, the, in homelessness, when it's used for homelessness response, that the customer show proof that they have contracted with the service provider. That is really the magic of how the rehabilitation happens in these sites, right? The, the shelter is one thing, it encourages someone to come inside, but the service engagement is what really changes a person's life and helps them move on. So we are super honored to partner with great service provider partners like Hope of the Valley, who operates here, Salvation Army, and many others across the country who are really engaging with people and providing those targeted services that are needed to help them change their trajectory in life. Well, it's absolutely delightful to speak with you. Thank you yeah, for you coming too. down, Amy. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.
Having a family emergency plan is critical in disaster preparedness. Knowing what to do and how to do it can help manage disasters with less fear and uncertainty. Your emergency plan should include your furry family members, and one of the ways to ensure your pet's safety is to make sure your pet is wearing a current city dog tag or your cat has a name tag with your phone number. Your dog, cat, bunny, or horse should have a microchip registered with your correct contact information. If you've moved or changed phone numbers, please make sure you contact your microchip company to update your pet's chip immediately. If you or your pet are separated, proper identification will help you reunite with the family. In the event of an emergency, family members, including children, seniors, and individuals with disabilities, should be aware of the location of survival supplies and go bags with important supplies, as well as an evacuation route within the home that leads to a predetermined meeting place outside of your residence in case it is unsafe to remain indoors. Train your pet to be comfortable in a portable kennel, which will make it easier and safer to transport if you need to evacuate. And just like your family go bag, you'll also want to prepare a pet emergency kit or a pet go bag, like a backpack or rolling bag full of emergency supplies, such as pet food and water for several days, making sure that perishables, such as food items, are replaced every few months. Part of your family emergency plan should include your list of out-of-state contacts, so family members will know who to call in the event of an emergency. You can sign up for LA City Emergency Alerts at notifyla.org and learn how and when to dial 911. Find a safe place to stay ahead of time where pets are welcome in case you have to evacuate. But it's best to keep them with you if possible. Keep your pet's vaccinations up to date so that they can be admitted to boarding facilities or cross state lines if needed. Identify and store necessary prescriptions, vitamins, face coverings, eyeglasses, and personal hygiene supplies in your go bag. Keep credit cards, debit cards, and cash in small denominations close to your chest for day-to-day -day spending. You may want to make sure photos and irreplaceable memorabilia are in an accessible place so they can be transported to safety as well. We also recommend making copies of pet vaccination records, microchip information, photos of your pet, your contact information, friends and relatives contact information, and any notes on pet feeding, medication, and behavior. Keep a copy of these items with a friend or family member or in a cloud storage where you'll be able to access. Disasters, emergencies, and evacuations can happen at any time, so being prepared is key to keeping you and your family and pets safe in case of an emergency. To learn more about pet emergency preparedness and to view our available resources, please visit laanimalservices.com. And to help prepare for an emergency, go to emergency.lacity.org. How did the Transgender Day of Remembrance begin? It started in 1999. The moment I realized Rita Hester, she was killed in 1998 in San Francisco. And up to this date, they haven't even uh, you know, gotten yet who really killed her. It happens most of the time in our community. The following year, 1999, Rita Hester was memorialized that started the Transgender Day of Remembrance. I think it's not just a month, we're trans every day, we're trans 365 days a year. Um, but I think especially in November, it's not just awareness, but also how can we make change in action? How can we go beyond just educating each other and our friends, our family, our co-workers, but how can we also implement policies, workplace guidelines, recommendations to be able to truly protect every single one of us? Every time I enter a supermarket, I have to think about, do I want to tell the, the cashier my pronouns if they misgender me and say, sir or ma'am? Do I want to tell uh, my coworkers if I'm, I'm, I'm coming out to a new coworker or if I'm going to a new uh, space? I always have to think about, do I come out in this moment in time? Is it safe for me to come out in this moment of time? And I think it's a constant process of coming out. I think my journey began when I was a kid like everyone else. Something internally was not matching. It really took that first trans person to tell me that you are valid, you, I see you, and you deserve to be here, just like everyone else. At the beginning of my journey, I was, I was alone. I was 
um, I went through and I was looking for my reflection, but it was more trans women and trans femme folks that helped me get to the spaces that um, I now kind of play in. It was also being able to see myself reflected within my community of other black trans men and black trans masculine folks um, that helped me get through this journey and say, okay, I'm okay. I'm in safe spaces. I'm in spaces that, um, that belong to me too. Not only have you all had your own personal journey, but you're embracing others and helping them in a number of ways. And you used to drive around with the LA Sheriff's Department and reach out to these women on the streets that were suffering similar situations that you were. So how did that actually happen? How did you get going on that? The thing that happened is my, my mentor at the time was uh, Jeffrey Prang, who used to be a mayor of West Hollywood when I started and he used to work at the Sheriff's Department. They started a, an LGBT advisory council with the Sheriff's Department. And I was asked by Jeffrey to be a part of that advisory council that advises the sheriffs. I worked with the community doing the policies also with the sheriffs on interaction with transgender individuals. That's how it all started. And I worked on the county jail asking for also talking to a lot of our, we're very lucky in Los Angeles that we have a, a section, a house for transgenders to, to, to uh, help them and also to, uh, for general populations, okay? So with that, when we started those, then because there's bigger problems with LAPD at that time, and then I saw what's going on with the community, how we are being treated, even with law enforcement at the time. And, and I, hopefully there's been progress. I mean, because, you know, speaking of helping, you have Invisible Men, a profound organization in and of itself. So how is that working and what is happening in that realm? We started because there wasn't a reflection of what, what it looks like for people of color to transition as transmasculine individuals. And so, and, 20 years ago when I transitioned, there were no terms for um, trans mask folks, and the only person that I could see in, in as a reflection was Chaz Bono at the time. So um, we started off as a storytelling platform to be able to allow trans masculine folks to own their own narratives and allow their words to be their own. And so now, here we are four years later, um, because I, I started in 2018, and now we've got 46 what we call legacies, and these are the folks that tell their story on our platform, and as well, so that the 46 legacies are from here to New York, and then we've got newer legacies. I'm excited that this agreement includes community engagement as part of several of its plans, and I'm especially glad to see that this will give our neighborhood organizations a role in shaping the story of Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Thank you. I am Loretta Herndon, resident of Council District 10. The agreement in front of you is a good one for the city and our communities, and it is past time to speak the truth about it and move beyond the fictions that a small number of people are speaking to scare Angelinos about gains that will bring so much good to Los Angeles. We're talking about good paying jobs with hiring focus on people who have historically been disconnected from opportunities. Lasting benefits to young people, especially those who have been shut out of sports programs because their families are struggling. Because of this agreement, they'll get those opportunities for free or at a very low cost. And it relies on existing infrastructure that we've already invested in, saving millions and guaranteeing that some of the issues we've seen in other cities won't be a problem here. This has been a thoughtful, inclusive process, and I can't wait to play any small part in making sure that the 2028 games are a success. Thank you. The caller. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Please go ahead, state your name and you have one minute to speak. 
Hi, this is Michael Steinborn with No Olympics LA. Uh, I just want to say that the idea that this process is public at all when this meeting was announced the day before Thanksgiving, actually the afternoon before Thanksgiving, and we're expected that there's supposed to be any public input here when it's clearly all business improvement districts and homeowners associations. When we've looked through this document and seen the reality of what this agreement is, it has no protections for Angelinos. It has no protections for the city budget. We're on the hook for all overages. This entire thing is a sham. City council members, Monica Rodriguez, Kerm Price, Gil Cedillo, Kevin DeLeon, and Mark Ridley Thomas have taken $10,000 from Casey Wasserman, the chair of LA28. Let's look into the corruption that's going on right now in 2016 in Rio. Just got sentenced to... Uh, a, a, pretty much a life sentence in prison for corruption. We're seeing it in Tokyo also. Thank you, caller. How about Jose Pizarro? I'm glad, How that, about I'm glad that you were, had advance notice and you were able to call in. Next caller, please. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Thank you. It's Eric Previn from Studio City speaking on behalf of myself and all the little you know, athletes around here. We love we love the Olympics, and we we're curious. You know about the first of all, it's nice to have Vika yelling so loudly from the valley for to be included, and in, you know we're, we're pleased for Mr. Waldman and Vika. But I wanted to just ask about the other costs. It looks like there's a 6.4 million dollar <throat> city can take that money right off the top to sort of. Um, as needed to promote one another and the brand of the of the Olympics. You know, uh, the other thing that I had a big question about, and I know that uh, it's not in there, is the, the pricing. I think waiting until 2025 is hard uh, because we have not waited to collect on all the exciting sponsorship programs. So I think, you know, the multitude of investments that you've been coordinating, I just feel like, you know, this is a real tough sell for rank and file public for two and a half, three weeks of great, you know, marketing and branding for everybody. Thank, thank but you, I, Mr. Previn. Thank you. Yeah. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Hi, my name is Alex Ibarra and I'm calling about the 2028 uh, Games Agreement. I grew up on the east side of Los Angeles and began playing sports at Evergreen Recreation Center in Boyle Heights. For many youth on the east side, it is crucial to have sports at a young age and at an affordable price. It's a way to kickstart a healthy lifestyle while instilling values that will carry forward to real-life applications. It is crucial that we continue to instill these same values in upcoming generations. By hosting the Olympics, it will give youth the opportunity to dream big that one day they could potentially compete for a gold medal. For those reasons, I am supportive of the 2028 agreement. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to call in, and we are here for our youth. Thank you so much. Caller, please state your name, and you have one minute to speak. Estela Suarez Hamilton. So I wanted to speak on the agreement for Summer Olympics. The first Summer Olympics in the U.S. was held in 1904 World's Fair. According to my favorite book, Spect Spectacle by Pamela Newkirk, great author, the World Fair featured a human zoo where people were trafficked from their nations to be forced into squalid exhibits on full display to celebrate American scientists. The people who died, who were killed, had their organs, such as their brains, trafficked, and many of their brains actually still belong to the Smithsonian Museum. Otabenga was the name of a black child who was trafficked by the World Fair. He was put on display as an adult cannibal, even though his age is now estimated to be 10 years old. In 1906, he was then trafficked to the New York Bronx Zoo and put on display naked in the monkey house. We the people are opposed to the continuation of the eugenic game. Thank you. Have a good day. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Please state your name and you have one minute to speak. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jacqueline DuPont Walker, and I'm president of WDC, a community development organization, and a member of LA Metro Board. I'm calling today because I'm excited about the 28 games, uh, 2028 games agreement. I'm glad to see this agreement calls for the entire strategy focused on local hiring. I'm also happy to see that it focuses on small and disadvantaged businesses making equity and action agenda. We can always benefit from more good, well-paying jobs, and the Olympic is an opportunity to give young people and people coming back into the workforce, those who need a second chance to get training and to career started again. If we do this right, there may be hundreds and thousands of people put to work at the 2020 Olympic, and they can put that on their resume. There's a great chance that, that we can get our foot in the door on construction and hospitality and all the other skills that make this community and the diversity of jobs work. I hope you'll support the agreement and the new start that it can bring to so many Angelinos. Thank you for all that you do, and we look forward to partnering with you in South LA. Thank you, Ms. DuPont-Walker. Caller, please state your name, and you have one minute to speak. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, this is um, Janet Walker, and I'd like to thank you for all that you're doing and to ask you to please remember that the people who depend on you to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to Thank you, Ms. Walker. Are you still there? Well, we thank you for calling in. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Good morning. My name is Alyssa Peterson and I'm a staff attorney with Unite Here Local 11. After denying access to the public for months and on the Monday after Thanksgiving, the city is ramming through a vote on this agreement. This is an atrocious start to a seven-year Olympic planning process. The agreement is woefully deficient on the most urgent issues that our city faces today, jobs, housing, and policing. It does not contain the word housing. It would expand militarized policing. It does nothing to ensure that the Olympics will create family-sustaining jobs. And to make matters worse, the agreement is silent on whether labor and community organizations will have a seat at the table going forward. Hosting the Olympics in 2028 could be a transformative moment for our city, but we have to get it right. We urge you to delay this vote for 30 days so members of the public can review and comment on the agreement. We also ask that the agreement be amended to ensure that labor and community organizations have a formal seat at the table in writing. Workers in the industries most impacted by the Olympics and community groups should make up a majority of every working group. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Yeah. Yeah, hi, my name is Eric Sheehan. You know, the eugenicist comments may seem far off, but how else would you describe a city trying to cleanse its image for tourists by sweeping homeless people off the street, just like it did in 1984? There are no commitments to human rights made in this agreement. All the flexibility being demanded is actually an excuse to avoid accountability. City Council is handing off power to the IOC to run the city for the next decade. So what's not in the agreement? A commitment not to displace or sweep on house Angelinos. Protection for low-income tenants and rapid gentrification guarantees of street vendors' rights, limits to a mass uh, expansion of policing and surveillance, a commitment to keep ICE and CBP out of our city, a reckoning with the environmental toll of hosting such a massive event, an opportunity for Angelinos to debate the merits of hosting the Olympics, any semblance of transparent public process, an exit clause, a way to cancel the Olympics and not do them if something terrible should happen, um, the bare minimum financial protections that we had in LA 84. If council can't negotiate a contract to include these basic protections and commitments, it must vote no on the gains agreement. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. 
Good morning. My name is Carrie Ann Robertson, and I'm a researcher at USC studying the impacts of the Olympics on host cities. And there's so many problems with this games agreement, but just to talk about one that hasn't been discussed yet, this contract is not flexible at all for the city of Los Angeles or for Angelinos, despite the rhetoric of Casey Washerman in the news. And one section of the contract called the recession principle locks the city into delivering a set level of municipal services in 2028. So to be clear, this means the city will be locked into delivering these services, even in the case of a recession or any other crisis. And I want us to be clear on what's happening here, which is that LA is giving up its basic authority to control its own activities in the case of an emergency, or more generally, giving up its basic authority from now through 2028. So this agreement concedes an unacceptable amount of power to LA28 and to the IOC, and it also places an unacceptable amount of risk on Angelinos. And City Council needs to vote no on this games agreement. Thank you. Caller, please state your name, and you have one minute to speak. Good morning, Chair and Council members. My name is Albert Lord. I'm Vice President of Government Relations and Arts Programming for Community Build, Inc. Community Build was involved in the Play LA Launch event at Algin Sutton Rec Center and collaborated with Rex and Parks and LA 28, which provided 100 food boxes and 6,500 pounds of frozen chicken to feed a family of four for four to two weeks. Community Build also sponsored swimsuits for the boys and girls to attend the aquatics program just launched at Algin Sutton. The Community Build is looking forward to building a stronger relationship with LA28 and support job training, job creation for the 2028 Olympics. Community Build is also committed to further develop economic empowerment for women and minority-owned small businesses to engage in the planning and participation in the upcoming 2028 Olympics. This all starts now. We are happy to be a part of it, and we support this games agreement. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for your work with Community Build. Caller, please state your name, and you have one minute to speak. Good morning. My name is Dick Bosbury. I'm a 1968 Olympian from Mexico City and competed at the Olympic trials at the LA Coliseum. And I'm serving as past president of the US Olympians and Paralympians Association and also past president of the World Olympians Association. And calling as an Olympian, uh, I'm in support of this um, LA 28 uh, agreement and in particularly uh, in support of working on the legacy plan uh, for the community because uh, we all know the great work that's been done with the LA84 Foundation um, in your community that's actually served the United States and the, uh, the Olympic family globally. So. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm confident you'll make the right decision and uh, appreciate the opportunity to support this plan going forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we have so much to gain from working with uh, present and past Olympians such as yourself uh, on the legacy of the 28 games. So thank you so much. We look forward to your involvement. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Hello, I'm Rosa Russell, a longtime community activist living in the district over 30 years. And I have had a chance to attend the Olympics in 1984, which was a exciting time. And I'm calling about the 2028 Games Agreement. I want to express support to the game agreement because it speaks to protecting the city and our taxpayers from financial risk by requiring LA 28 to support to set aside millions of dollars before 2028. We may wind up uh, saving a lot of money afterwards, which would benefit the community for years to come. So I am happy that this agreement includes a lot of insurance at the 1984 we know LA can host the Olympics 
and not run into debt. So I support hosting 2028 and encouraging you to support this agreement. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much, ma'am. And we look forward to your continued involvement. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Hello, my name is Brian Gavidia and I'm calling about the 2028 uh, Games Agreement. I support the 2028 Olympics and the agreement because it's clear, it's clear that our community will benefit from hosting the Games. I think the proposed agreement provides a framework for the city to reap real benefits, um, as, uh, such as good paying jobs for residents of disadvantaged communities and funding for youth to play in sports leagues and to learn to swim uh, from an early age. Um, I appreciate the city is being intentional about using existing infrastructure and I ask that you support this agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Hi, this is Robert. Hi, this is Roberta Via from District 14, and I'm just calling in support of the agreement. Um, I work with youth that are incarcerated and adults uh, returning in prison, and um, I was very happy to see that you included a youth sports partnership and also um, <clears throat> a partnership with arts and culture organizations, and uh, anything that promotes. Um, a broader, richer um, opportunities for the people residing in Los Angeles. When it's mentioned about the workforce, um, it doesn't really state that there's going to be hiring of people who have a record um, reentering society. I would really like to see that emphasized. Um, but I'm just very much in support. I have such fond memories of the Olympics watching it with my dad, Olga, Corbett, and gymnastics were our favorite. And the idea that families would be able to go and see the Olympics in person is such an opportunity that we cannot pass it up. And so I'm in full support. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Go ahead. Your name? Hi, this is Cheryl Santiel. I am calling in support of the agreement. I actively participated in the 1984 Olympics as a volunteer. I also worked um, and have participated in a lot of the parks and recs um, activities, which I saw the funds from the LA 84 used to support inner city youth. I'm excited that LA has the opportunity to participate or have the Olympics in 2028. I'm looking forward to volunteering again for that Olympics. And I'm definitely in support as a member of the community that the Olympics is back um, in LA and looking forward to the work that it's gonna do even, even past 2028. Thank you Thank so much. Caller? Please state your name uh, and you have one minute to speak. Go ahead, state your name and you have one minute to speak. Hi, good morning. My name is Kenta Estrada Darley and I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Responsible Community Development, a nonprofit community development corporation in South Los Angeles. We are in support of the proposed 2028 Games Agreement and the incredible potential for the Games to economically and socially benefit community members, youth, and local businesses. This is especially true for communities such as South Los Angeles that have been historically underserved and under-resourced. We are happy to see that the agreement calls for an intentional strategy around hiring locally and engaging locally owned and underrepresented businesses. 
Our community can be benefit greatly from more good, well-paying jobs, and the Olympics are an opportunity to give young people and people coming back into the workforce a chance to get the training and career start they need. We look forward to working with the city and the organizing committee to create pathways to living wage jobs and contracting opportunities for community members that have been historically excluded from these opportunities. We hope the council will support the agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Caller, please state your name and you have one minute to speak. Go ahead. Good morning, Chair O'Farrell and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rob Notoff, Policy Director with the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, and I'm calling to say that we're initially supportive of the games agreement, but we also understand that this is merely an initial framework and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. We all know that uh, we have a great opportunity at hand to make sure that all of the jobs associated with these games can be good, high-quality union jobs, but, th but that can only happen if we continue with regular stakeholder meetings between LA28 and our labor affiliates. To quote Sister Gilda Valdez of SEIU 721, one of our strongest uh, affiliates, these jobs need to be of the highest quality standards, period. Additionally, we're appreciative of Council President Martinez's letter that outlines three recommendations for continuing an interactive process with labor, and we look forward to, con to, to the committee implementing these recommendations, which will guarantee that labor continues to be at the table as we further flesh out job standards and ensures that we can all continue the tough work of making sure that these games reach their maximum potential for LA and leave behind a stronger economic le legacy for LA's working families. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we look forward to our continued relationship with labor as it relates to the games. Thank you. Mr. Chair, there are no more speakers in the queue. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing as there are no more speakers, Colleagues, what I'd like to now do is move to the item. Uh, Mr. Litt, if you could please read the item. Uh, yes. CAO and CLA uh, to report relative to authorizing the mayor uh, to execute and um, council president to execute the games agreement and fifth amendment to memorandum of understanding contract number C-129859 with the Los Angeles Organizing Committee for the Olympic and Paralympic Games 2028. <clears throat> and the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee to extend the date for council approval to December 8, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Litt. Colleagues, this highly anticipated games agreement, which city representatives have worked tirelessly to negotiate, making sure we have an agreement that benefits city residents and provisions <clears throat> ranging from local hire, ample small business involvement, especially uh, after 20 months of the COVID-19 pandemic, which still impacts many of our small businesses. A cultural festival, uh, including the arts and various cultures in Los Angeles, Native American involvement, comprehensive insurance policies and environmental Im impact protections. Each of these provisions, along with the rest of the report, bring us one step closer to seeing a better Los Angeles in the long term. I'd like to take us through a quick timeline of our journey that brought us to this point. In August of 2015, we moved forward a CLA CAO report titled Proposed Bid for the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games, requesting that the city attorney, with assistance from the city administrative officer and chief legislative analyst, negotiate and present for approval an agreement between the city and the Los Angeles 2024 Exploratory Committee setting forth the general terms and parameters of the city's role in bidding for the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. We designate the city administrative officer and chief uh, legislative analyst as the city's lead negotiators in all matters related to the Olympic and Paralympic Games. In September of 2015, the city council unanimously agreed upon the process we are now engaging in. We requested the city attorney and the city administrative officer and chief legislative analyst to act as the lead negotiators on behalf of the council in regard to the host city contract, joint marketing program agreement, and any other ancillary 
documents or agreements for the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And on August 9th of 2017, we considered the agreement to take the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games after some incredible dynamics in the development of awarding the Games to Paris in 24 and Los Angeles in 28. Following the negotiations, the draft agreement now comes to us for deliberations. And today, we consider the Games draft agreement. I want to thank our CLA, Sharon So, uh, our office, John Wickham, Alex Whitehead, and our CEO, led by Matt Zabo and Roberta Roth, our mayor and the LA 2028 uh, committee for working on this draft agreement that is before us today. This is a framework that addresses risk management, reimbursement for city services provided, community business and workforce development that includes local hire, sustainability, supports advancement of the city's applicable sustainability goals, such as the city's goals for zero carbon transportation, zero carbon grid, zero carbon buildings, zero waste and zero wastewater. And, and as the chair of the Energy and Climate Change, Environmental Justice and River Committee, very important to my committee members and myself and the whole entire city council. Uh, and then arts and culture, Native American, mobility and transportation, public safety, and of course, legacy. And one thing we learned from 84 is uh, the legacy of, of LA 84 and what that continues to provide Angelinos across the city. <laughs> I want to acknowledge the first of its kind International Olympic Committee funded program in Olympics history. And that is in partnership with LA 2028, our LA's youth sports program which was executed in September of 2020. Our youth sports program provides $160 million in support to increase access and participation to youth sports in the city, and we already see the positive impact. This agreement addresses the key elements that were brought up during our committee hearings, including local hire provisions, small business involvement, a thoughtful comprehensive approach, approach to the arts and, and culture, comprehensive insurance policies, environmental impact protections, in addition to legacy. And we've come so far on this journey already, identifying the sites for the events, the uh, Olympic villages. Um, we've done so much work so far, and we've helped put this on a pathway to what I believe will be the most successful games in, in the Olympic and Paralympic history. I understand what it is from the CAO's office and the CLA's office and LA 2028 to present uh, and answer any questions uh, that you may have. And um, we'll start with allowing CAO and CLA to go over the report uh, before we begin our, our questions. So Ms. So and Mr. Zabel, we welcome you and we want to thank you and your departments for really the the incredible and comprehensive and time-consuming work to just get us to this moment today. Uh, and so we welcome you to present. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, good morning. I think it's still morning. Uh, Sharon So, the CLA's office. Uh, with me is Matt Zabel, uh, CAO's office, uh, as well as our staff, John Wickham, uh, Alex Whitehead, Ben Seha and Robert Roth. We also have with us City Attorney and LA 28. Uh, the item before you today is a joint CAO CLA report on the proposed games agreement, which is pursuant to the council's previous action to approve a bid for the 2028 Olympics and Paralympics games. Uh, as part of the council's approval, uh, in 2017, it included an MOU which served as the initial framework for the roles and responsibilities, commitments and obligations of LA 28. Um, the city and LA 28, along with the city attorney uh, and our offices have recently committed, uh, completed negotiations. We've held numerous meetings, which were uh, delayed uh, extensively by the pandemic. Um, but what we have before you is a proposed games agreement 
which continues each and every MOU commitment and obligation that was contained in the previous council action. And most notably, those provisions would protect the city from financial risk. Um, this games agreement is intended to serve as a template for further negotiations and discussions and commitments of LA 28. Um, we've heard some comments that there are not enough details in this games agreement. Well, the games and agreement was never intended to provide each and every one of these details. The games are over six years away. And really what this games agreement was intended to do was to protect the city from financial risk and also to establish a process by which we would address very important city policies and programs. And this games agreement essentially creates the vehicle for that public input and engagement for the uh, very specific details of each one of those important city policies and pro programs. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Matt to discuss the individual provisions of the games agreement, but they generally focus on the delivery of uh, city resources and reimbursement of city costs and addresses the legacy of the surplus and how we move forward. Uh, a commitment by LA 28 on the various programs that Matt will discuss that are important to the city administrative obligations and legal obligations. Um, and then there are a couple other recommendations in this report that uh, also include uh, departments designated a liaison to assist the CAO and CLA as we move forward on this process as well as a fifth amendment to the existing MOU to provide us time uh, to, for the execution of this games agreement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will just give uh, the committee a, a high level overview of what's in the games agreement so we can get to your questions on the details and uh, comments from LA 28 uh, should you so desire. Um, as our CLA said, the games agreement provides a number of processes, uh, but also importantly, protections to the city and a number of commitments from LA 28 um, that governs how we will uh, move from now to the games. Um, first and foremost, uh, the games agreement establishes a, uh, a process to establish base levels of city services and city resources and reimbursement for additional resources that will be required uh, additional resources and services that would be required during the games. Uh, we will establish uh, what we're calling normal and customary, customary levels of service uh, by October of 2024. Uh, we will then enter into an enhanced city resources master agreement um, that would include the rates, timelines for reimbursement, uh, et cetera, for services that would be required over and above what the city would normally require. Uh, and that will be established uh, by October of 2025. And there also will be uh, venue specific service agreements uh, that will be established and agreed to by October 2026. Uh, the games agreement details a number of commitments uh, by LA uh, 28. Uh, it includes a number of legacy agreements uh, that uh, relate to how the surplus, should there be a surplus, uh, funds will be distributed uh, accessibility, human rights, and community access to the games. Uh, it also includes uh, agreements on local jobs and workforce development, sustainability, arts and culture, mobility and transportation, and public safety. Um, on the legacy pieces, uh, first and foremost, and importantly, uh, on the surplus, 80% of the surplus will go uh, to uh, LA 28, to an entity that will be established by uh, January of 2028 uh, for the benefit of sports and youth in the city. Uh, the city and LA 28 will hold an equal number of seats on the board of directors of this legacy entity uh, charged with dispersing the dollars. And that would apply to the overall board and uh, specific committees on the board. As it relates to community access to the events, LA 28 will collaborate with the city to make affordable tickets available to moderate and low-income individuals, to residents near the venues, students, veterans, and youth, uh, and to caregivers of persons with high dependencies. Uh, as it relates to community jobs and workforce development, LA 28 will develop and implement in close coordination with the city 
a program to ensure small, local, and underrepresented businesses have access to contracting opportunities. Uh, LA28 will also develop and implement a program for local hiring. Uh, and that includes working with the city's personnel and economic and workforce development departments to leverage regional and city local hire programs. Uh, on sustainability, as uh, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, uh, there will be a detailed sustainability plan that will be established in close coordination with the city by March of 2025. There will be a working group that will develop uh, and, and implement the plan. That working group will be established by 2023. Uh, the games agreement also outlines processes and timelines for an arts and culture plan, mobility and transportation plans, airport operations plans, and it also reinforces uh, the public safety plans approved by the Council in April of this year. Um, and finally, and importantly, and, and again, uh, just to restate, I'm not covering all of the items in the games agreement, just uh, some select highlights. Um, but importantly, as it relates to transparency, and reporting. Uh, LA-28 is required to provide annual reports to the Council, which will include uh, updated budget information, management uh, discussion and analysis, financial forecasts of revenues, expenses, and construction costs, updates on uh, venue infrastructure and improvements, uh, a listing of all contracts entered into that exceed a million dollars, uh, updates to insurance, reports on the Youth Sports Partnership Agreement, uh, financial reports, audited financial statements, and then once the working the policy working groups are established, uh, updates on the progress of those working groups. Um, I will stop there. As uh, as our, our CLA said, um, we have uh, from my office Ben Seha and Rob Roth available to answer questions, uh, and there are staff from the CLA's office, city attorney's office, and I believe the mayor's office as well uh, available to answer your questions. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Sharon. And before we uh, go to questions, let's uh, see if LA28 has anything to add to this, and then we'll open up a discussion after uh, both presentations. And I, and I saw Mr. Wasserman uh, on here. So Casey, if you have anything to add. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, uh, good morning, or I guess maybe not officially anymore, Sharon, not morning. We're past noon now by four minutes. So good, good day to everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, enjoy the time with, with family and friends, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be back with this committee. Uh, a lot of what I was going to say has been covered. Um, I, I just want to point out that um, as we sit here today, we're roughly seven years from the Games beginning. Uh, I believe we've used these interim four years that are unique in Olympic planning history to establish a solid foundation for success, to engage um, with the community in the broadest sense, including the implementation of our Play LA program, which as you said, Chair, is, is the largest single investment in any city's public sports programs uh, in American history, not just in Olympic history, uh, and obviously engage with all stakeholders as we move this forward. Um, this agreement, is, as was said by both the CAO and CLA, is, is meant to create provide a framework uh, for the next seven years, a working cadence and rhythm, hold us accountable to the things we believe in or are committed to, and provide an opportunity for broad civic engagement to produce a games that benefits all of LA. Um, obviously, uh, we feel uh, uh, comfortable uh, with, with all the things we're being held accountable because they've been central tenants of our bid and now our, our games hosting plan. Um, this is obviously an extension of our MOU from 2017 uh, and we are incredibly excited to be partners with the city and all of the different communities and stakeholders in LA um, to deliver these games. Um, this agreement, as, as Sharon said, provides us framework and flexibility to be responsive and responsible as we progress through the time frame uh, leading up to the delivery of the Olympics and Paralympics. Um, it's, uh, it's a great lesson we have learned that flexibility is a key attribute to delivering a successful uh, event at this scale. Uh, and we will all be proud to welcome the city, uh, the world to our city in 2028. And I look forward to the next seven years of working together. Uh, I do wanna thank the entire city family, as you said, Chair, uh, a tireless effort from all the stakeholders at the city and the city departments involved, the mayor, the council, uh, prior council members, uh, obviously city attorney, CAO, CLA, and the staff have done a really incredible job and uh, really excited to be partners uh, for many years to come and, and deliver a world-class games to Los Angeles for the third time in our history. Thank you so much, Casey. Yeah, I, I, I think 
framework and flexibility is they're really great guiding principles uh, moving forward. And, and with that, I'll, I'll start with some questions. I'm, I'm gonna first ask questions to our CEO and CLA and then, and then I'll, I'll move down to you, Casey. And that is um, the first to the CEO and CLA, uh, compared to previous games agreements, both in LA and, and elsewhere, to your knowledge, has there ever been a legacy entity that designates the host as an equal representative in control of the legacy entity governing board? In other words, how, how unique or how normal is this particular part of the framework? Um, so I think we have John and Ben that can address that. I am not familiar with another entity uh, or another games agreement having a, a legacy entity such as this, where we have equal representation, but there are many unique qualities about this particular games in 2028. I mean, to have a contingency uh, set aside, to have requirements for insurance, uh, there's a whole host of things that um, have been incorporated uh, in this particular games agreement in Los Angeles to protect us from as much risk as possible. So uh, maybe I have John or Ben address that, or Matt, if you know of any uh, situation where we have had a, another city, whole city uh, have such a provision. I don't go, Rob. Hello, uh, Robert Roth from the CAO's office. Um, in many situations, this is really an unprecedented uh, agreement. Um, I personally have tried to, to find uh, precedents from other agreements and past games. And a lot of times we've had uh, little luck in finding that. So to answer your question, I think this is very unique. And um, if anyone else has something else. But, but uh, to, your, to your question, Mr. Chair, uh, this um, equal rep representation uh, was what we sought, uh, what we asked for, and um, what we're presenting to you today. It, it will be very important that the city benefit directly from the, uh, from the surplus, which we believe and hope there will be, and that those dollars are spent uh, as closely coordinated with the city priorities as possible. Um, so that's what we sought, and that's what's before you today. Thank you. No, that, that's that's terrific. Oh, and, and let me pause for a quick second and acknowledge uh, Monica Rodriguez joined us. She was had another committee she was attending, and, and she joined us during the public comment section. So so welcome, Councilmember Rodriguez. Uh, my my second question is is um, it, it's no secret that we are in the middle of a climate emergency. On the Energy and Environment Committee, we that's that's the the, the theme of. of pretty much every committee hearing that we have and all of our uh, work on that committee. Um, while the city is putting its best foot forward enacting some of the most progressive climate policies in the country, by 2028, new climate disasters and challenges may very well emerge from the year round wildfire season, earthquakes, so forth. What provisions as currently written will protect the city uh, if any of these natural and in many cases, sadly, man-made disasters occur prior to the games. Hello. Uh, oh, there you go, Rob. Uh, thanks, sorry. Robert. <laughs> sure thing. Um, well, this agreement includes a, a pretty robust risk mitigation area. Um, within it, we have insurance that covers a wide variety of um, well, there's a requirement for LA28 to provide a wide variety of insurance. Um, I believe Matt mentioned it before, but uh, I'll go over them. Uh, natural disasters, including uh, communicable diseases, terrorism, civil unrest, civil cyber attacks, event cancellation, and so on. Um, this is an area though that we, we anticipate continuing to look at. Um, best practices have been discussed and, and as those best practices and, and uh, areas of concern come up, we will continue to have discussions with LA-28. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think the 20 months of a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic have really informed our approach uh, to, to this particular uh, issue. So thank you for that. Um, I read in the report that there are local 
higher provisions of, of great importance and, and to many of the callers as well. Uh, can CAO or CLA elaborate on if that has ever been a focus of a framework and to what extent, uh, comparably speaking, uh, and the impact that could have on creating and employing local Angelinos to high paying good jobs, in many instances, labor uh, agreement jobs. So um, once again, I'm not familiar with uh, provisions in other cities, but uh, in, in terms of our particular uh, agreement uh, under the games agreement, uh, there will be, uh, as Matt had mentioned, uh, a local hire work group uh, that will formulate plans to ensure that there is local hiring, um, as well as, you know, it, it working with our personnel department, with our economic development department, uh, to ensure that there is as much local hire at good, high-paying jobs. Uh, those details will come forward uh, uh, starting as soon as uh, of March of 2023, um, all of those goal goals and plans uh, must be in place in accordance with the games agreement by March of 2025, if I remember correctly. And the, the games agreement specifically calls out a focus on hiring individuals belonging to communities that have been um, historically underrepresented in, in the workforce and have faced barriers to employment. So um, consistent with our targeted local hire program, for example, we wanna make sure that this effort focuses on, on communities that have not been represented previously. Terrific, and, and uh, we have so much work to do in this area and years to do it. And I'm definitely going to uh, really push for going beyond local hire and going right to local recruitment for jobs in these communities. Uh, and, and that's the beauty of having lead time, uh, and we'll make the most of that, so thank you. Uh, since the games are less than seven years away now, uh, what's the process if we need to amend the agreement, if necessary? What would that process be? Well, um, sir, Robert Roth again from the CIO's office. Um, amending the agreement, um, um, we've been very focused on um, preparing this version of the agreement, but an amendment to it would inevitably um, require a council review of it, as well as approval by obviously LA28 and review by uh, the IOC. Um, all the agreements that we bring before you um, have a, um, a requirement that the IOC is in agreement with these, and uh, that would be part of the process as well. All right, and that is something that we've really talked about through years of committee hearings, and that is uh, this is building a relationship. Uh, it, it's not just any one entity. A successful games led by the host city uh, with a partnership of the host committee and the IOC, uh, and as Casey mentioned, framework and flexibility. Um, once the city council approves this agreement, um, are there any other steps before it becomes final? So this would be the final approval of the games agreement. Um, it, it, signatories would of course be required, um, but that's not to say that there are not going to be many, many reports coming back as a result of it. Um, there's already an annual report that is necessary uh, as part of the games agreement, um, but it, it is our intention to bring back um, the many components that are included in the games agreement for further council consideration. And in fact, they are to be uh, addressed in the annual report and to the extent that council at any time wishes more information as it relates to any provision of this games agreement and the working groups and the progress made that um, uh, we, we, we collectively, CAO, CLA, LA28 would be required to uh, present uh, any and all information that you request um, as we continue uh, this progress toward uh, the 2028 games. All right, thank you. Uh, anyone have anything to add? No? Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna just jump to Casey here. 
Casey, in, in relation to the legacy piece, what does, and I quote, in close coordination with the city mean in, in relation to the legacy, the community business and workforce development, sustainability, mobility and transportation, and arts and, and culture programs? And um, so, so in general, and, and I, I'll, I'll break this up into, into three questions. How will the city be participating and how will LA 2028 ensure coordination in relation to the legacy agreement? Uh, so thanks for the question. I'll take those sort of separately because unless I'm missing, I think there are sort of two things. So there's these working groups that we've established as part of the, the framework we've been working on going all the way back to the MOU. And now we sort of created more detail around as part of this agreement. And let's start with, you know, the city has representatives on the board of directors of LA 28. So those city appointees are obviously representative of the city and its perspective on the day-to-day -day matters of LA 28. And then within the working groups, um, the working groups are intended to create a framework for the for the priorities, as you mentioned, a chair for, for the city and the communities. And it's important to have, it's important to have people on uh, on those committees who represent the city. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, the joys of uh, home zooms. Uh, um, people on those committees focused on on the areas of expertise, whether it's labor, civic, community groups, or or the like, and they will be involved in each and every one of those committees as we progress through this process and both establishing and operationalizing them. When it comes to legacy, obviously, uh, as it was described. Uh, we are partners in that effort. Uh, our job is to create the legacy, so it's important to remember a legacy is created after success, not, not in anticipation of success. And we are keenly focused on delivering these games that can produce um, a financial legacy and, and, and the subsequent foundation that will be established coming out of these games uh, will truly be a 50-50 partnership with the city to benefit the city's interests, youth, and, and, and sports programs. Um, will you... Will you identify and invite people outside LA 28 to participate uh, on the working group and in the development uh, of uh, any plans in relation to legacy? Yeah, of course. Obviously, the, we, we want area expertise in, in each of those areas. Obviously, it's not an expertise that we could or should have in house. Those are we want to use the, the best and most talented and important people. Um, uh, in, in our city to to benefit each of those working groups in each of those areas. That's why they're working groups as opposed to um, employee structures um, uh, as part of this as part of our organizing committee. And Casey, is there a is there a, uh, a process for exactly how to include uh, the various community groups in this effort? Um, I just look at the collaborative process with the city and the and the stakeholders, um, and obviously led by uh, our board and the board members who have that perspective. So you know, it's a it's a process that would be quite transparent, and open, and it's one that's incumbent upon us to work with you and and the stakeholders in each of those areas to make sure we're producing against those results and producing in the best way possible uh, for the city and and the and the Olympic Games. Right and. There are, are no performance dates listed for the arts and culture program. Obviously, it's almost seven years away. <laughs> but when will LA 28 initiate that effort? And when can we expect to have um, a, working, a working plan uh, for review? Uh, well, the arts, you know, it's obviously it's one of the great legacies of 84, uh, Jared. And obviously, we want to make sure we... Um, execute the 2028 version, not a redo of the 84 version. So uh, as, as you remember, that, that happened much, much closer to, to 28 and actually, um, or to 84. And, and, and I, that's one of those things that will get planned and, and put in place as we get much closer. So it's one of those things that framework and flexibility sort of apply to very clearly because yes, it's a legacy of 84. Yes, I think we have a powerful opportunity to do our version of what is the arts, uh, arts legacy. And at the same time, want to make sure that we don't, uh, decide today what we should be doing in 2027 or 2028. And uh, so how, how does the games agreement itself ensure that the city, i.e. city taxpayers, are not paying or underwriting uh, for the services and resources that directly benefit the 2028 games? So I think it was a... Uh, um, uh, 
explain that there's sort of a baseline of services that the city operates at. Uh, and our job is to make sure that, that any cost above that baseline across city services uh, is reimbursed fully by LA 2028. And so we, we worked very clearly with the city to make sure that the city was protected. Uh, we weren't asking for more for free. We weren't, you know, whatever the city does, it does. And whatever is, is needed beyond that um, is, is uh, the requirement of LA 2028 to reimburse the city for those services uh, in whole. Okay, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, colleagues, just keep in mind, this is a framework that we're adopting. We're not adopting any final, final details. That'll be in the ongoing process uh, and the journey that we are uh, have been and will be embarking on uh, with with the games as as they approach over the years. Uh, I'll have uh, additional instructions and recommendations at the end of uh, this discussion, um, and including uh, some of the important matters that were brought uh, forward by the council president's letter. Uh, but before we get there, uh, I'd like to open this up and I believe Mr. Uh, Koretz, uh, you had your hand up first and Mr. Uh, Rick Corian and then Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the LA 28 Olympic Organizing Committee and to our CAO and CLA for all the great work that has gone into this agreement. This is an enormous opportunity to repair some of the very real economic damage that COVID and the affordable housing crisis have inflicted upon Angelinos. It's an opportunity to make real transformative lasting change for decades to come as we can currently take the very real and transformative steps we need to to address the global climate emergency as was mentioned by uh, our, our chair earlier. I want LA 28 to be a showcase for the city of tomorrow because that's where LA is headed in some cases and in others where we need to head sooner. A city where we've solved affordable housing, where we've solved homelessness, where our essential lower income service and hospitality workers can make a wage that supports their families to actually live in Los Angeles and where our schools provide an excellent launching pad to wherever their children want to head next. A city where we've made a just transition off fossil fuels and left no one behind as we cleaned up our skies and our atmosphere, and a city that coexists with its wildlife and actively protects and creates access to nature for all Angelinos, which is, as we've become quite aware over the last nearly two years, important to everyone's mental and emotional health. So to get to that city of tomorrow, today we need to ensure that the Olympics don't displace Angelinos. We need to ensure that our housing stock isn't snatched up by Airbnb to rent to the highest bidding tourists. It greatly disturbs me that the Olympic Games has an official partnership with a company which is actively making our city unaffordable for our residents. Also, we need to make sure that our hospitality and service workers are paid what they deserve so that they can actually afford to live and raise their families in Los Angeles. Now, I'm excited that the games are coming to LA. I can hardly wait to attend uh, uh, many of the events, but I do have some concerns and questions. And so I'll ask a couple. Um, first of all, our, our negotiations for this type of agreement generally done with public input and why or why not? Um, well, just from the Olympic, you know, we are unique in that we're a private entity delivering the games, uh, council member. And so normally these, uh, the delivery of the games are, are really public entities. Uh, so they're one and the same. They're, or they are functionaries of, of the, of the government of those cities or, or countries. So, um, they're not truly independent organizations that have these kind of arm's length agreements with, with partners like the city of Los Angeles and, and LA 28 does. So, you know, it's what makes LA unique is that as we did in 84 and we will do here as we will privately uh, secure and deliver the games as opposed to it being a, a civic uh, entity that delivers the games and is responsible for, for the delivery of the games. No, no different than when, you know, we're the only city that is 
privately funded an Olympic bid. So there was no city money spent to bid for the games and every one of the people we compete, every one of the cities we competed against were funded by their um, federal governments. So yeah, Sharon or, or, or Matt, do you have anything to add, add to that? So that was a somewhat indirect answer, by the way. Uh, not that I disagree with anything that you said, but um, so is the general public usually involved in negotiations in this type of agreement? So, no, because, uh, oh, sorry. Go all ahead. right, Casey. So, Councilman, the, the, the council specifically directed your CAO and CLA to negotiate. Um, that's what we did. We negotiated with them on this gains agreement. The public input uh, portion that you're referring to, I, I think what I hear LA 28 saying is that they will be committed as part of these working groups to be soliciting uh, input from them via, uh, um, whether it be public testimony or other outlets uh, to gather information on these very important city policies um, that you have highlighted. And so that will be an ongoing discussion. I think that's how we're gonna get the public input. This has been a negotiation that has been um, done strictly by your CAO and CLA at your direction. So no, there has not been public input on that because that's what a negotiation is. Okay, and uh, when we created the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office and Climate Emergency Commission, we spelled out exactly who would be on the commission and from which neighborhoods down to the individual seat which begs the question, so who exactly will be on these working groups and how will they be chosen so that workers and community representatives and small businesses and environment and environmental and sustainability advocates are well represented? Well, I, we, we have a process in place to ensure that these working groups are representative of each of the areas of expertise that they speak to and serve um, and obviously uh, we'll work closely with uh, the LA 28 board, of which, as I said, there's both US OPC and LA city representatives, um, as well as community members, labor leadership, all, all on those boards. And, and our job is to make those working groups be as effective as possible, Council. And so they will be public and transparent. And you know, if, if there's thoughts and feedback from any of the council offices or others, but I think it would be a mistake to specify today. It's a little different. You know, we're delivering a singular event for 17 days in the summer of 2028. It's not a permanent structure. And so the expertise needed for that is different than a permanent structure like you described. And we want to make sure that the people in those working groups, right, this isn't just a generalized arts and cultural group. This is arts and cultural around the delivery of the Olympic Games, period, right? So it's a very focused delivery in each of these categories, which are going to require us to have specific expertise in each of these areas around the delivery of those working group work product specifically for the delivery of Olympic Games, not in the broader sense, because that's not our remit. Well, and I, I would just encourage that we find ways to have all of those groups represented. For so sure. Just, so, just uh, looking forward. Um, Councilman, on that, on that front, just, just quickly, the, the, the agreement does um, specifically uh, define what close collaboration is. So before any final decisions are made, the city uh, will be consulted and will be able to provide material input um, before any of these decisions related to the working groups is uh, is executed. So we, we did include that in the agreement. So we will, uh, to the extent that there's um, recommendations from you, from other members of the council, from the mayor's office, um, that can be uh, directly uh, provided to LA-28 prior to making final decisions. Great. And council member, and, this is Robert Roth, also from the CAO. If I could uh, follow up on what Matt had mentioned and sure. Mr. Wasserman had mentioned, the city is a member of each of the working groups. So that does provide a level of transparency, um, an awareness of what is occurring and, and uh, an opportunity for the city to, to um, communicate its priorities through these working groups. Thank you. And I have two more questions. One, uh, a study from the University of Oxford found that virtually all games since 1960 have had cost overruns averaging 172%. So if every Olympic Games has kept the host city significantly on the hook since 1960, 
with the exception of uh, our 1984 LA games. Um, uh, contingency fun is a good start, but how exactly do we make sure that Angelinos aren't massively on the hook for cost overruns if we have pandemic problems or extreme heat or drought or other climate uh, acerbated problems um, or cancellations? Um, most of these weren't concerns back in 1984 when we had a very cost effective games. And I'm not even sure that they were high enough on the radar screen in 2015 when uh, we started this journey. But things have definitely changed and there, there are uh, possibilities for huge expense that we hadn't anticipated six years ago. So, I mean, it sounds like we're, we're pledged to work on it, but it's not locked in enough for me to feel comfortable and not quite uneasy. How are we sure if we have some disaster that cancels the games or makes the games uh, very difficult for some or all sports to be performed? Uh, how do we guarantee that we're not on the hook for a billion dollar loss that we didn't anticipate? So I think you're, I think you're asking a couple questions. The, the first is that Oxford study, which we can debate it at a different date, but I think the, the point that you made clearly is 1984 is the exception and 2028 is the exception because of one simple fact. We have no capital construction budget. So most Olympic Games have an operating budget, a capital budget. We don't have a capital budget because we are not building a single new venue, period, full stop, no exceptions. And so our costs are very defined and controlled as we head up to 2028, whereas most games aren't because there's the operational cost and then there's the construction cost. And those construction costs uh, don't ex literally don't exist uh, for our delivery of our games in any regard. We have no requirements for new venues. We have no requirements for additional infrastructure. We have no requirements for additional hotel rooms. Everything we have is in place today and frankly was in place when we put our bid in, in 2016. And that bid is the bid we would deliver today if we if we didn't have new venues popping up that created more opportunity. But, you know, we don't, even the rail lines that were under construction in 2016 or the airport that was under construction in 2016 was not part of our delivery plan for 2028. So our plan was what was in place in 2016. And we believe that plan is great. We believe the plan will continue to improve, but the risk for games in traditional cities comes from a cost perspective. Our risk comes from a revenue perspective if we can't deliver the revenue to cover the cost. Although we sit here today with well over half of our revenue contracted uh, and, and we are prepared to deliver the games um, um, if we had to with the, with the revenue we have today. Now, we don't believe that that'll be our final revenue number, but we feel very confident in our ability to drive revenue continue over the next seven years because of the economic platform that is both Los Angeles and the United States and, uh, and our ability to leverage incredible venues, incredible universities, incredible civic locations to make these games uh, truly unique. Um, but again, my job is not to deliver the games in every city on earth. My job is to deliver the games in Los Angeles and delivering the games in Los Angeles is truly a unique opportunity, which is why we're able to sit here and create the structures, create the economics, create the opportunities and with your help, create the legacy uh, of 2028 that's going to benefit the city for a long time to come. And, and you make the argument that I made when we initially uh, started this whole process, which is that our costs are going to be so much less because we have every venue in place that you could possibly imagine. Correct. I still think we're, we're underestimating the worst case scenario. So I'll just put it out there that I have those concerns and, and I'll let it move on. Hey, I'm going to interject here. I'm going to interject here for a second. Sharon or, or John, can you uh, can you explain to Mr. Koretz the the cost overrun discussions and agreements that we had, and we made not just in the city but with the state, and then and then the involvement of the feds to provide uh, security. Yes. So, um, going to Mr. Koretz's question, there's actually a, a quite a few other things too, um, in addition to what Casey he mentioned um, that construction has been mostly the cause of the overruns in many of the Olympic Games. Uh, us having many of the venues not having to construct an Olympics village is going to make a huge difference in our games. Same reason as was in uh, during the 1984 games. But in addition to that, from the risk 
mitigation, you know, we, we do have the comprehensive insurance requirements uh, that will be in place, uh, as well as the contingency that you addressed uh, a little bit earlier in your comments. But there's also going to be the ongoing reporting requirements that kind of will serve as an indication to us well in advance if there are any problems as it relates to the revenue risk that Casey mentioned or any other concerns that might arise as a result of you know, global uh, 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 actions or whatever the case may be. So that will be part of uh, our ongoing review in the annual report. There's also a number of other things that we have taken steps to ensure that we are protected from further financial risk and that being in, for example, in changing venues outside of the city that was negotiated as part of the MOU. So any venue changes would require city approval. Um, the city being part of the board of directors, uh, the city being part of the legacy program, um, the provisions for reimbursement of city costs um, that are over and above what is considered normal and customary. And then, of course, there is the federal and state um, assistance. Uh, the state has already approved a backstop uh, as part if there should be cost overruns, and this was approved uh, several years ago. And, of course, the federal support for the designation of the city uh, Olympic Games as a national uh, special security event. So that's in there as well. And also to remind ourselves as part of the annual report, you know, we, we did bring in uh, KPMG to review the budget uh, actually a couple of times as it related to first the 2024 bid as well as the 2028 bid. So we've taken a number of steps and I think I've only touched on a few of them, but there are many other uh, provisions that we have taken. We cannot eliminate all of the risks, Mr. Kretz, but we have done our best to eliminate as many as possible. So anybody that tells you that we've eliminated all risk, um, I would uh, take that with a grain of salt, but, but we have done our, our darnest to uh, ensure that um, we deliver uh, a, a games with LA-28 that is um, protected, the city is protected from uh, fiscal uh, impact. Okay, and I, I won't beat a dead horse further. Um, let me you ask- You wouldn't one... do that, Mr. Peretz. You would not do that. <laughs> I, I, uh... Uh, not literally, for sure. Um, a, a last, more mundane question. Uh, one of my staffers, who's a big fan of the Olympics, ordered some items from the la28shop.org and was sent a T-shirt that wasn't completely sewn and the wrong size of another T-shirt and a coffee mug and a baseball cap that was done right. So 50% of an order done right at the time when they're not inundated with orders uh, doesn't give me great faith that when they start getting hundreds of thousands of orders a day and our city's name is right there on the items that uh, uh, this will go as as well as we hope so how well did this vendor get vetted and how can we improve things dramatically for when it starts to really count well, I'm sorry to hear that, and, and, and one mistake is one mistake too many, so if you want to have your staff member reach out to me, I will make sure it's rectified. Uh, our our e-commerce... I don't care about that. I just wanted to point out the problem. Well, I, I don't know I, I don't know if an incident's a problem, but it's, as I said, one, it's one, 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 is too, one is too many, but, you know, our vendor is Fanatics. Uh, they're the single biggest e-commerce company uh, for sports in the world. They own the exclusive rights to every sports league uh, in the United States. Uh, and they are by far best in class. Um, and so um, uh, it's obviously uh, something I'm happy to check into. And if you want to please have your staff or call my office, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure uh, we dig into it. But that's uh, unacceptable. But I can tell you we have the best provider in, in the world and the provider that every uh, world-class sports organization is partnered with as well. Yeah, I just hope that they're not too big to pay attention. That's why I flagged this at this early they, stage. They paid us a lot of money for the rights to do this. I can assure you they're paying attention. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kretz. No dead horses. M Mr. Kikorian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you to, to our team for all your work in, in uh, putting forward this agreement. Um, I, I just want to um, build on some of Mr. Kretz's points a little bit about uh, risk, because I think for the last 
decade, uh, it's been my job on the council to be the most risk adverse member of the council when it comes to the city's money. Uh, and I think uh, the work that we've done uh, collectively on this committee over the course of the last few years has made this agreement um, that's before us now such a belts and suspenders kind of uh, uh, agreement that I'm, I'm satisfied that we, um, it's not without risk, but the risk is, um, is minimal given the um, upside potential. And uh, I, I think we've, we've done, we've crafted that in just about every way imaginable. And now I think we have additional learning from the Tokyo Olympics, which I think at some point, uh, hopefully Mr. Wasserman will, will talk or, or his team will talk a little bit about lessons learned from Tokyo and, and how, you know, we will benefit from those lessons learned as, as well. Um, but in addition, we have the extended time period of the extra four years that we hadn't anticipated, which gives us you know, tremendously more opportunity on the revenue side to build up additional partnerships and so on and, and reduce that risk, risk level as well. So I'm, I'm really quite satisfied that the, you know, sort of the, the stuff that you hear about cost overruns in, in other places, it, it's almost intellectually dishonest uh, to compare this Olympics proposal with um, other places that are building, you know, entire cities essentially for the Olympics. It's just, it's not, it's not a fair comparison at all. And on that point, it's also not a very fair comparison to talk about other negative aspects of the Olympics compared to Los Angeles, because when totalitarian regimes um, bulldoze entire areas and displace people in order to accommodate the Olympics, um, that's a very different scenario than an Olympics that we're going to host in this city in which we do not build one single venue. So um, it, it, these are just not realistic comparisons. All that being said, um, I want to, to focus on a couple of uh, issues that have been primary concerns of, of mine, and um, uh, I'll do them one at a time so that I don't monopolize time. The first one is uh, determining the impacts of the city's budget uh, on this agreement. And this agreement, Mr. Wasserman mentioned that sort of uh, the concept that baseline services, what's normal and customary, uh, should continue to be the obligation of the city, as we would expect, whether we had this Olympics or not. But anything beyond that, should be borne uh, on the budget of LA 28. You know, if there's enhanced services that are necessary for the Olympics, that should not be the burden of the taxpayers. I think that has been our goal. And um, the, the agreement that's before us goes into considerable length to figure out where that dividing line is. And that's never a simple question to answer. So I'd like our team to talk a little bit about um, how the baseline was determined for normal and customary services. And a few specifics, why did why was the fiscal year 22 through 24 period utilized? Um, what obligations, if any, does that impose to uh, uh, upon our city budgeting process as we go forward? So if there was a subsequent recession, say, or a need to cut services as we experienced in post COVID. Um, how does that implicate the agreement? Um, and then also how do other government uh, entities, the federal government, the state government, others that are participating in one way or the other in the Olympics, how do they determine what the city's normal and customary services are for purposes of our relationship with federal funding, state funding, uh, with regard to the Olympics, is, um, are there are there differences between what we're doing in this agreement and what, say, the federal government would expect of of us in terms of maintenance of effort and 
and so forth. So I'd like you to talk through those larger points and then I might get into some more specifics. Hello, council member, this is Robert Roth again from the CIO. Um, the discussion about city reimbursement for city resources has been something we've discussed a long time. Um, it's an important area, um, and as you've mentioned. The, um, the process that we've developed to determine normal and customary services um, hasn't been, I mean, I think one of your questions was how did we determine it? Um, I mean, we will determine what the normal and customary services are based on the venues and events that will be host, that will be hosting um, uh, 2028 games within the city of Los Angeles. Um, we took a look at uh, different scenarios of how to how do we figure out what those costs would be, what is normal. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is determine based on a, a discussion from the departments themselves and, and, and a coordinating effort, which we've mentioned uh, within our report. Um, that the CIO and CLA will undertake, um, gathering information and data from individual departments. How much, what is the service level for trash pickup, for example, on Figueroa during the summer? Um, we would like to determine if that's one, one pickup per day, then we would identify that as a, the normal customary amount. When 2028 wants to have uh, an event that affects Figueroa, and they're requesting three pickups each day because of uh, the crowds. Well, the additional two pickups is, is what we identify as an enhanced service. And that would be charged to LA 28. Um, the city would still provide the normal and customary amount, but LA 28 would pay for the other two. Um, the same would be for, for all city services, um, whether it's you know the staffing for um, transportation, you know, if we have uh, traffic control, you know, if there's a certain amount that would normally be at an event that the city pays for, well, then that's what normal customary is. Um, in the case, of, I, I read an article about the Coliseum and services that the city provides for events at the, the Coliseum. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think that those are normal and customary. Um, those are separately contracted and, and, and in those situations where it's not normal customary, well, that's excluded from, from the discussion that we are, uh, anticipating to have when it comes to determining normal customary. Um, uh, one of your questions was about the obligations if there was a, a downturn in the economy, if there were cutbacks within the city. Um, I think that's a complicated question. Um, what we determine in 2022 through 2024 as normal customary, if there's a significant change, um, there is a, there is, a, uh, there is an area where there could be an issue for 2028. It doesn't obligate the city to provide services, but we would possibly be um, below the level that we've agreed to providing services um, in the event that there was an enhanced service level required. In my earlier example, instead of one, uh, one trash pickup on Figueroa each day, if we cut it back to half, a pickup each day, then um, you know the city uh, could be in a gap between that half that's not picked up and the additional two that LA twenty eight would like to have. It's a discussion that LA twenty eight then could could have with us. Maybe they reduce the amount that they need, and so um, perhaps they would also look to changing their plans if there was a significant economic downturn and um, the service levels would expect it to be uh, changed. As far as the California and federal determination of what our normal customary is, I don't think this agreement speaks to that. Um, no, but I, I recognize that it doesn't, but what I'm wondering is, are there other standards that the federal government, for example, might apply to what are, what's our maintenance of effort in terms of, let's say, local law enforcement or local services before they would uh, provide federal support for, you know, um, additional services? And is there any conflict between those measures and what is contained in this agreement? I guess that that's where I'm going to is, is whether 
such outside maintenance of effort requirements are consistent or inconsistent with what we're providing for in this agreement. I, I don't have a, a response on that um, specific situation. Um, perhaps one of my colleagues may have something. I, and I'm not asking specifics. I mean, broadly, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, it, we're not agreeing to something in terms of normal and customary services here that is somehow, you know, fundamentally different than what we would be required to provide before being eligible for federal grant funding or something for in this, the very same area. And Councilman, that, that's something that we can work out through the negotiation process of establishing what is normal and customary. And there, we're required to meet, we're required to meet in good faith to exchange proposals. We will have to go through that process and that, that information could be part of the conversation. Okay, great. And, and on that, and thank you for that, uh, Mr. Zabel, on that point, the enhanced services agreements are still not part of this, right? That's still to be negotiated. Correct. So if there were a need to determine a, maybe a different way of looking at enhanced services, we could continue to negotiate that as part of the enhanced services agreement. Correct, correct. Okay, okay. so on, on that point, let me just get into something a little bit more specific then. Um, uh, because I, I don't know that it's necessary to address in this agreement, but it will at some point in the enhanced services agreement. And, and that is this, Mr. Wasserman mentioned the need for flexibility because of the years uh, that remain before the uh, Olympics uh, begin. Uh, that's certainly true for LA 28. It's also true for the city of Los Angeles. And um, there's a, you know, there's a, the farther out that we go, the less predictability there is in our own budgeting process. Um, but one thing is for sure, the Olympics is a big and important event, but it is an event that's going to take place for 17 days in 2028. And it is not an event that is going to drive budgeting decisions that the city is going to make over the next several years. It just isn't. Our decisions about our budget are far, far bigger than the Olympics. And so I, if that being said, um, if, if I, we're going to need to address the situation where the city may, may have to make hard choices because of the economy that have nothing whatever to do with the Olympics. Um, and uh, if we reduce services in a certain department because of the conditions of the economy, I, I, it, it's just that has to be the normal and customary level of service that would apply to the Olympics regardless. I mean, because we're gonna be making those decisions entirely independently of the Olympics based upon revenues to the city and the needs of 4 million people, not the Olympics. So <clears throat> I, we can leave that for another day, but I wanna plant this seed uh, of thought because Mr. Roth, you, you raised the example of, you know, well, if we do X number of pickups, you know, with our sanitation trucks on Figueroa, then that, you know, should be the baseline. And, and if we all of a sudden reduced service to Figueroa before the Olympics so that we could add it back and get reimbursed, of course, that would be ridiculous. And, and that would not be what we, we want to do, uh, what I, I think, um, either party to this agreement would, would want to see happen. But on the other hand, if we had to cut back sanitation pickup across the city of Los Angeles because of economic needs that have nothing whatever to do with the Olympics, then you know I think there has to be some adjustment in what the concept of normal and customary service is at that point, because the city can't be left in a position of, you know, not being reimbursed for any increase that may be requested by the Olympics over what has become a lower baseline. That just, it just wouldn't be fair. So uh, anybody else can, can offer any thoughts on this at this point, but I think as long as I have the assurance from all of you that those fine points 
can continue to be discussed in identifying what enhanced services are in the context of the enhanced services agreement, um, then, then we can move forward. But um, I just wanna make sure we have that opportunity. I, I, Councilman, that's, that's how I read it. I, I read in the flexibility that we could uh, introduce those concepts. Um, perhaps we could, I could ask the city attorney uh, to provide that assurance as well. Correct. Sorry, it's a little dark in here. This is Dan Kreinbrink from the city attorney's office. That'd be correct. And we will be engaging in, um, in the enhanced services agreement in the next couple of years too. And, and we could, we're going to continue to refine these points, um, on an ongoing basis. So, uh, that is correct, Matt. Great. And, and then I related to that, as long as the city attorney is on the line, um, I, I read this concept of normal and customary services to be relevant to us because it's a baseline for when, for how to measure enhanced services that would be reimbursable. What Correct. I don't read it as, and I hope that it is not, is some sort of enforceable mandate to maintain a level of services uh, at a certain level, regardless of the economic circumstances of the city. Is that true? Well, that's the way we, we look at that as a baseline for determining what the enhanced services that they will need will be in the enhanced municipal services agreement, the FTE, okay. you know, the hard numbers. Uh, we just, you know, they need a baseline to determine that and that's what it's used for. Okay, terrific. Uh, thank you. I think that covers uh, my concerns about um, normal and customary. I have other questions about procurement, but I don't want to uh, monopolize the time uh, so we can come back around to, to me on that, if that's okay, Mr. O'Farrell. Certainly, Mr. Kerkorian. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Price has his hand raised, and then uh, Mr. Cedillo after Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I appreciate your, uh, your leadership in guiding us through this uh, uh, important, uh, important discussion uh, and important opportunity. Uh, Casey, hats off to you and to the uh, 2028 committee for your, for your hard work and, and also, to, of course, to our city family, uh, CLO, CLA and CAO. Uh, again, appreciate the work that has gone into this. Uh, I've got uh, not so much a question, I guess, maybe a comment. Maybe, maybe there's a question as well. Certainly a great deal of interest in uh, section nine, uh, talking about uh, community, community, uh, community business and the workforce development commitments. And I think the key word here uh, is transparency. It's making sure that uh, folks are involved uh, who have some interest and who wanna have some input uh, in this process. Uh, I know separately a big discussion going on uh, about the involvement of, of black and brown workers and black and brown businesses. Uh, and so as these, as these working groups uh, emerge, is, is there gonna be any way to quantify uh, specific goals, objectives uh, regarding, regarding uh, segments of, of the, of the uh, of community uh, to sort of benchmark uh, opportunities for success and, and, and for progress along those lines. Um, well, I, I mean, I think the important thing about the working groups is that they're, excuse, excuse me, uh, the working groups is that they're representative and they're, and they're public. So, you know, we're, we're not, again, we want these groups to be engaged in the broadest way of, and representative of the community. And that's, that's been our approach the entire way along. So, you know, we're looking, looking forward to working closely with, with you and, and, and all the council offices to make sure we have true best in class experts, true uh, community representatives, labor, all the sort of relevant factors in each of the working groups that really are going to affect a positive outcome from each of those verticals. I think it would be a mistake to quantify in advance numbers, um, given each of those 
different opportunities and different different challenges and different delivery mechanisms. I want to make sure we have the best people that are truly representative of our city. How is, how is it envisioned that these individuals would be, would be selected to be a part of the the working group or the ad hoc committees that may be formed? I think it's a collaborative process between the board and and labor and the and your council offices and and subject matter experts in each of those areas. I mean, there are subject matter experts we're going to lean on for certain areas and. Uh, we want to make sure that your council offices are involved, and obviously the LA 28 board is represented both of the city, the US OPC, as well as broader Los Angeles, and we think all those constituents are going to push together to deliver working groups that are going to deliver against each of the milestones for that will set um, to deliver the gains in those areas. Well, I know our council office certainly wants to be uh, wants to be involved and engaged. Transparency is very, very important, and I think all anything we can do early on, saying that framework letting folks know that they are, uh, that the thoughts, ideas, suggestions are going to be welcomed uh, and considered. It's going to be important as we move this, move the uh, process forward, making sure that it's a successful Olympics that benefits everyone. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you as we, as we move this issue forward. Thank you, Mr. Price. Uh, uh, any other questions, sir? None at this time, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Cedillo. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. It's been a, uh, a long morning with a lot of points being raised. I have a perspective um, from my district um, on some of these matters. So first of all, let me start with uh, transparency and public input. Those discussions, I want to note that all of us here, uh, the council members are all elected uh, to represent our districts. That is a public process. It's a democratic process. It's a transparent process. So for me, uh, a lot of these questions I see as kind of sophomoric in many respects. Uh, this committee process and the structure of the city is basically that process for those concerns to be addressed. And so it's incumbent upon all of us in our individual offices, like Mr. Price has just indicated, uh, to raise those concerns. That is the nature of a democracy. This is a representative democracy and not a town hall meeting. And so I just want to raise uh, that point. Uh, second, with respect to the history of the Olympics and the various studies that apply, I think that as a baseline, that history matters and that reality matters and that we have to be reality-based. And I think we've been a little uh, tepid in our response about the concerns that have been raised. I think we need to say very clearly that those studies that were referenced uh, are closer to fraud, uh, or it's closer to fraud to suggest that those guide our analysis and perspective. They do not apply to the city of Los Angeles. And so we should not engage in some type of Olympic hysteria uh, as we go forward. We have incredible challenges in front of us, and I think we should deal with them honestly and concretely. Um, there is no, I think we could say that probably the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. Uh, and we can live and dwell in that uncertainty, or we can choose uh, to lead and to go forward. My perspective is that we are in a pandemic for which we don't know where the ending is. We have late reports, the latest reports are that we may have a new strain and that we have a significant part of our population, both in the nation, but in our city, that is not committed to science. And so it's difficult for us as a city to talk about what we're prepared to deliver to do these Olympics when, you know, we can talk about the environment, but there's also an environment where a significant part of our fire department uh, doesn't want to get vaccinated. And I don't know where we're gonna be with respect to this pandemic as we get moved towards the Olympics. And so there's a, a very profound and pronounced sense of uncertainty that is within our control. Uh, and we have to figure that out as we, as we go forward. Uh, I look to the Olympics now, I appreciate them for the, for the games that they are and the competition and the sports, the role that it plays in our society. I know the positive role that it plays uh, in low-income neighborhoods. I know the positive role it plays in communities of color. I know the inspiration 
that it creates for uh, people in our community. I'm very uh, convinced about that. But today I'm also focused on the questions of our economy as we come out of the pandemic, the nature of our economy. We are a service-based, tourism-based uh, economy. This can have a major positive impact in our economy. It creates opportunities that could be abundant, but not, not absolute, not necessary, not determined. It is for us and this committee and the collaboration between this city, us, and this committee, Mr. Wasserman and his team, and the global Olympic movement and all the other entities that are involved, the feds, the states, et cetera, for us to make this opportunity a reality. And that is what we are here to do today. Uh, I am, I think there are some things that we know uh, in terms of small business that Mr. Price has, has raised that for much of the city, uh, much of the employment is through the small business community. And so this is a real opportunity for us to make sure that we can gear up, jumpstart and boost many small businesses. I will note that 50% of the city is Mexican or Mexican American or Latino. And so I would hope that the committee uh, with its representatives can take note of that, that all these opportunities that we talk about 50% of them should go to uh, the Mexican, Mexican American, Latino immigrant community. Uh, it is prepared to make contributions to this effort uh, at every level, at the highest levels and at the base levels. At everything that's done in the Olympics, uh, there is a rich history of how Latinos can contribute uh, to this uh, experience here in Los Angeles uh, as they have in the past they deserve their place in this movement, not only in the countries that rep they're represented in Latin America, but also here in the city of Los Angeles, the home to uh, the largest uh, Latino community uh, outside of many of the countries that make up uh, Latin America. I think that it's um, important for us to recognize, I, I see this a little bit differently. When we talk about more services for the city, the city going beyond its normal and customary um, processes and delivery of services. I look at this as overtime. I look at this from the perspective of the city worker, the county worker, and the state worker. As a representative for the city, I welcome and embrace these opportunities for us to do more work because it means that these families that are part of the city family will have an opportunity and will budget and anticipate that they're going to do more work that there's gonna be more cleanup, there's gonna be more uh, delivery of services, there's gonna be more overtime, there's gonna be more experiences uh, for them to have for them and their family. And so I see this as a very positive thing. Uh, the public sector and the delivery of public services to me is vital and critical for the Olympics. And so I welcome the Olympics uh, on behalf of the city and behalf of my district, because I know that the public sector welcomes I don't necessarily look to the nonprofit community to do the things that we do day in and day out in the public sector. Uh, I note also that when we talk about the public sector, as we heard from Gilda, uh, it's good jobs, period. Uh, that these jobs are all unionized. These jobs uh, are people who have expertise in what they do. Uh, these jobs uh, also provide health care, also provide a pension. And so I look to the boost that the Olympics can provide uh, for our city, particularly as we, you know, look strategically forward, how we handle this pandemic and how we deal with that and the other uh, ecological and uh, economical and moral challenges of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. I share your sense of optimism. Thank you so much. Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to everyone involved in getting these this agreement before us. I'm ecstatic. I'm excited to move on this agreement and bring the Olympics to Los Angeles in 2028. Of course, there are concerns, questions. I support our council president's uh, letter with those 
recommendations asking for our labor partners, other stakeholders to be included in the working groups that will support city priorities. Uh, in the agreement, there's not, not much to ask for. And I, you know, every time we meet, I, I'm reminded of uh, the opportunity for the city. I'm reminded as a fourth grader in 84, jumping in my dad's Pinto, taking us to the corner of PCH and Western to see that Olympic torch run down on its way to our Coliseum. Um, at the same time here as a, as a council member, um, we have an opportunity, I have an opportunity to bring forth some concerns about the ability to, to ramp up or to revamp the transitional job opportunities program and make sure that that's part of our agreement. You know, the, the city's incentive in our contracting process for companies to hire transitional workers I strongly believe in, in second chance policies. Mr. Kokorian and I, uh, we ended up joining forces to um, combine the transitional hire incentive uh, with um, um, a small local to make the overall program more powerful. And the final ordinance, if you recall, colleagues, uh, was just recently uh, went into effect. But I see the games agreement before us and the provisions for small, local, and underrepresented businesses, as Mr. Cedillo alluded to, um, to be able to include these provisions. Um, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see uh, any mention of, of employers who hire transitional employ employees, um, but we should include transitional hire in the agreement alongside the small local and underrepresented provision, just as we have recently done as a city family. Um, so we're transitional, just a question I had, were, were transitional employers considered when developing the games agreement? And if not, what's the best way to incorporate transitional employers at this stage? I don't know if that's a. Uh... Well, there, I mean, there are small business provisions, so the, that would, those would reach the the smaller employers, right? Is that your intent? Yes. Um. Right. So, so we do have a small business component to that. Are you looking for something, in in looking for larger businesses who are, I'm I'm not sure where in transitional employers. Um, goes beyond small businesses. So the larger, the larger employers who actually embrace our, um, our transitional job opportunities programs. So I think in the hiring program component of this, we would want to make sure the working group looks at that question and, and, and opportunities to expand transitional employee hiring as a, as a priority. So in a, in a report back, I know you may have a few report backs, Mr. Chair, but I'd love to see um, the report back on how best to incorporate the transitional employers in our community business and workforce development commitments uh, as part of the agreement. And secondly, to um, Casey, um, you know, what we're seeing in parts of the, of the city, uh, potential sites for training facilities um, is just ref remind me, can we use existing um, uh, green space um, facilities um, to use to, to welcome athletes in specific parts of, of the district or of specific parts of the city for training? Absolutely. Absolutely, Councilman. It's going to be completely vital that, you know, high schools, parks, all yep. over the city. I mean, you got 209 countries bringing their teams here and they're going to come a little bit early and to the extent that they can afford it and, and use our great city to practice and prep for their game. So it's, there's going to be people all over the city practicing and getting ready for, uh, for these games. And it's going to be uh, everywhere and all over the place. That's their responsibility to procure and pay for, but it's ours to create those opportunities all over the city for them. Fantastic. And as we see in our airport, uh, billions of dollars in improvements there, um, any, any detail on the operation airport operations plan, or are you working with Lawa on, on this piece? Yeah, as we get closer, we'll obviously start to dial that in as, as um, you know, that's obviously we're in close coordination with La La and, and working to make sure that, you know, we take advantage of all that the new LAX is going to have to offer as it's really, you know, going to be a true spectacular addition to the city once it's complete and, and it will be operating a few years before the game. So we are at uh, close coordination with them, but operationally, as we get much closer, that will start to take, take a lot uh, more effect. 
appreciate that. Just look forward to, to making sure that, um, you know, there's, there's coordination, communication going on, uh, on uh, as we welcome the world to LA in 28. Councilman, um, also, yeah. Um, so there are actually provisions in the gains agreement for a mobility and transportation plan, including an airport operations plan. And so we have built in um, provisions to make sure that those uh, conversations are happening. Got it. So, so, Mr. Chair, I, I would, I would, I would, you know, look forward to those report backs, but I would not delay um, any progress here with this agreement. Uh, but also be mindful of the our labor partners, um, those who called in expressing concerns. I think we can hash that out in the coming in the coming months based on um, Pre Council President Martinez's letter uh, with those recommendations. So. Um, you know, I will move move on this and then let the games begin. Bring it to LA in 28. Let's do this. Thank you, Mr. Buscaino. Yeah, I, I think we all share the level of importance. I certainly do of, of involving labor in this. And that was definitely one of my planned instructions regardless. So uh, I think we're, we have unanimity on that, on that, uh, that piece of it. Mr. Kukorin, you had some uh, follow through questions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I think this touches upon some of the comments that Mr. Price, Mr. Cidio, and Mr. Buscaino all, all made um, with regard to the jobs creation opportunities in the private sector uh, that the games uh, presents. And uh, many of us uh, in this committee worked on the Compete for LA concept of uh, upgrading LA Babin and our procurement process ensuring that we encompass as many procurement opportunities for the games and many other large events that are coming to Los Angeles in that platform so that um, the widest range of businesses, small and large uh, in the LA area get to participate uh, in these events uh, to the greatest degree possible. And I appreciate that the games agreement includes some of uh, that. There is, um, you know, a commitment to working with the city on, um, on this and, and that's good. I, I would, you know, my hope is that it, it will be stronger, that commitment will be stronger than that. Um, but uh, I recognize that we can't anticipate everything that, that might happen in the future. I'm just to, to be um, a little bit more specific, let me see if I can find the language in the agreement. Um, so uh, section 9.1.3 provides that the OCOG agrees to work with the city to utilize the regional solicitation system, which we currently know as LA Bavin, as it concerns applicable OCOG contracting opportunities related to or supporting to the 28 games. I, that's great. I'm a little concerned about the vagueness of language like um, applicable OCOG contracting opportunities because from where I look, um, every contracting opportunity relating to the 2028 uh, games would be applicable to uh, use of the regional solicitation system. And so I'm, yeah. I'm kind of wondering where, where we are. Let, let me just dive in because I think the, the reason for that is, and Matt, maybe if, if you want to add, but so for example, uh, Councilman, when we, when we rent the dorms at UCLA, we will be using their staff, right? Because their staff delivers their employees who work at the dorms, food service, cleaning. We're not replacing that staff with our own staff because that would be obviously both cost and operationally prohibitive. So we are renting Staples Center. We will use their staff for their operations of their building. We don't, we're not replacing venue staff when we rent a facility. We're using their staff because that is the most efficient effective. So not all employees, we're not hiring operational staff for every employee, every venue we're operating because we're not operating any of the venues. So in other words, when it comes to procurement and those kind of things, a lot of these things are done in those facilities and privately owned facilities and we're just a renter for a month. Okay, but, but that's, I think of that as a little different circumstance. You're not separately contracting for, you know, hospitality services within venues, 
are you? I mean, that, that just comes with the venue. To, you know, the hospitality rights were sold by the IOC, which will then contract with the venue. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of moving pieces here that, look, one of the operational efficiencies we will get is not, you know, is keeping our staff levels down at the core OCOG and using the leverage we have these private venues. It's one of the advantages of venues here and facilities that are privately owned and operated is to leverage their expertise and their operational infrastructure to our benefit from a cost perspective. So yeah. it's a little bit of mix and match. It's not such a clean clear line between who does today. So I think what it's saying is where we're in a position for procurement and hiring, go through the mechanisms we discussed. We've hired a procurement person, frankly, taking your lead on, on how important this issue is to really get ahead of that. But it's also incumbent upon us to leverage the operational expertise of the facilities and the venues we're gonna be renting and using during the games. To be sure. Um, but again, those venues could readily uh, to the extent that they're contracting services um, I would think that it would be in their interests actually to utilize uh, the procurement platform that we have so that they have for, for, for sure to the extent. opportunity for cost efficient procurement and the best possible competition for for those contracts uh, uh, agreed totally I just want you know there are as you know as, as well as I do just take UCLA for example public university public bidding rules, state governs those things. We can't force them to order things in a way that does outside the state laws. So there are things that gets pretty nuanced and complicated here beyond that and private facilities, you know, so we're just, the, 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 the broadness of this or the lack of specificity is because there's so many things. Again, the Clippers are building a new arena, you know, like, okay, that didn't exist in our plan. So there's lots of things that are coming online or opportunities here that we want to take advantage of without creating a system that forces us to spend more money than we need to for procurement in, in ways that we can leverage existing infrastructure and facilities. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I think I understand that distinction. And, and if, if that's the distinction, then, you know, honestly, I, I think we've got a strong basis for, for moving forward because I don't think anybody's talking about changing staffing at, at venues or, or things like that. This is more the whole idea of compete for LA is to allow contracting parties to have the best opportunity to compete uh, for the work that is going to be contracted by the Olympics. That, that's really it. So um, that, I think that should be non-controversial and it sounds like uh, it will be. Um, just a little further to uh, Mr. Buscaino's point about transitional workers. Uh, one of the places that I hope we'll spend some more time uh, talking about it, I don't Know that we need to spell it out in this agreement, but how we can leverage um, the procurement process to include social enterprise uh, employment as well. Um, social enterprise employers uh, participating in the contracting process so that, you know, folks uh, who are part of LA Rise and other programs that we have going on in, in the city now have an opportunity to benefit from the games as well. Again, that's, that's really, who, who, who is hired by the social enterprises is not LA 28's issue. I, I don't think it needs to be spelled out here, but what is important is that those social enterprises have an opportunity to uh, participate in the procurement process and benefit from the potential financial opportunity that that presents them, providing that they're provide, assuming that they're providing the same level of service and the same, uh, same or better cost effectiveness as any other contracting party. Um, and again, I think that's non-controversial and it helps to spread the benefit in the greatest possible way. Does anybody on our team have any thought about that and how, how that's captured or not captured in this agreement and where it could be captured if it's not? Councilman, I, I, I read that as captured broadly in, in what the working group uh, could consider and, and dictate. Um, there's on, on 9.1.2, there's a, there's a number of uh, items there that the working group would consider and uh, uh, communities it would reach out to. I think that's, I think that's squarely within the purview of the working group. I think, Casey, do you agree with that? Yeah. Very good. Um, I, I don't, really have anything further at this point. I'm, I think that this 
the agreement has really gone far from where we started years ago in this process in ensuring uh, not only the risk mitigation uh, to reduce the city's risk, but also enhancing the, uh, the benefits that the city will receive in terms of legacy programming, in terms of hospitality and tourism during the games, but at least as important as that is the business uh, growth opportunity and jobs creation opportunities uh, leading up to the games as well. So um, I'm happy to support it. Um, and I look forward to hearing the recommendations that the chair has with regard to uh, other changes. Thank you, sir. And Cedillo, you had uh, additional uh, comments or questions. I just wanted to note the uh, important role that the County Federation of Labor plays in this. Uh, they are on the board. And I think it's significant in the past, uh, I had the privilege and honor of working both with Bill Robertson, Jim Wood, Gal Contreras. Uh, their voice speaks for organized labor. They, their participation, the participation of Ron Herrera is critical because it ensures that a reasoned, mature uh, voice of working men and women is going to be heard, that it's going to be at the table, and that there's going to be um, a guarantor of unionized labor and all that that means and all the value that it comes with that. And I think that's probably one of the most significant uh, growths as this process has gone forward. It'll be critical, as I stated, uh, for us to understand and to seize the opportunities that uh, these games will provide for the working men and women of the city. So I just wanted to close with my support, obviously, uh, for this before us and uh, note that uh, how important the role of labor, organized labor, uh, is in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. And thanks for stating that because it has in, been implied here and there that that is not the case but it has always been the case. So thank you for stating that for the record. Uh, and colleagues, thank you. This has been a terrific uh, conversation. Uh, thank you to LA 2028, Casey, and uh, thank you to our CLA and CAO offices for all your great work and dialogue. It might appear that this just showed up easy uh, almost two weeks ago when it was published, but a lot of very serious nego negotiating back and forth took place. And again, this was the process unanimously approved by the city council way back years ago when we started down this journey of hosting the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, so having said that colleagues, my goal in being a member of this committee all these years and now chairing it has always been and will continue to be seeing a better Los Angeles the day after the 2028 Olympic Games conclude. We approach our task with a clear recognition of the considerable challenges that currently face our great city to get the best Olympic Games agreement ever of any city and one that helps us build a more livable and equitable Los Angeles post 2028. I think of the 2028 Games as a prime motivator to leverage our collective resources to make real and visible progress on the production of coveted affordable housing, homelessness, climate change, equity, social and racial, and not as some have claimed to sweep our challenges out of, this, out of sight or under the rug or hide anything nor can we allow our approach to bringing a successful Olympics to Los Angeles be led by fear, cynicism, and negativity. Hope is the process of setting goals and following through on them. Optimism is having a positive thought pattern. We have good reason for both. We only need to adopt the Olympic Games motto as our guide and put it into action faster, higher, stronger, and just added in 2021 to the motto officially, together. We have seven years to get there, seven years. 
And now, having said that, uh, I move to approve the recommendations in the report to execute the games agreement and Second. thank you, sir, with recommendations of the council president, I would like to add the fall and, and my colleagues on this committee. I'd like to add the following instructions. We're going to move up the CAO and CLA report timelines by one year. So I'm requesting that the CLA and CAO present a report by March 31st of 22. That establishes benchmarks and deadlines for LA 28 to establish working groups that include labor and community and create plans for the various city priorities listed in the games agreement. And furthermore, request that CLA and CAO in coordination with LA 28 present a report by April 30th of 22 and every six months subsequent through the conclusion of the 2028 games on LA's, LA 28's progress meeting these benchmarks and deadlines. This re report should include which groups LA 28 has engaged with on each of the six city priorities outlined in the games agreement, including but not limited to stakeholders from labor, community-based organizations, and specific communities impacted by the games. And those impacts can be positive and include in the report back transitional employees alongside small, local, and underrepresented, per Mr. Buscaino's remarks. And Mr. Cedillo has seconded uh, these amendments. And uh, if there is no additional discussion or thought, what I just mentioned, colleagues, we will move forward. Having said that, Mr. Lid, would you please call the roll? Uh, yes, Council Member O'Farrell? Aye. Council Member Buscaino? Aye. Council Member Carretz? Aye. Council Member Rodriguez? Okay, moving on. Council Member Price? Aye. Council Member Krikorian? Aye. And Council Member Cedillo? Cedillo, aye. Very good. Six eyes. Thank you, sir. Uh, having taken taken this vote, uh, Mr. Lid, what else is before this committee? Uh, that clears the desk. Thank you so much. This is yet another step in this journey. We've got nearly seven more years to go. Faster, higher, stronger, together. Let's do this. Thank you so much. This meeting is adjourned.